Hi, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome, Jonathan. I'm afraid there's not going to be any music for you tonight, this evening. And I, I think uh, my talk also clashes with a, with a major event this evening, so I'm, I'm quite pleased that so many people have come uh, to see this. And uh, if I hear anyone shouting or cheering tonight, I'll know that uh, it's either the, 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 the talk's going well or, um, or the UAE have scored. It's going to be one or the other. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the, um, the submerged landscape, mostly the submerged landscape of the Arabian Gulf. Um, it's interesting, in 2013, uh, Knut Bretzka uh, mentioned that um, between about 30,000 years ago and around about 10,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago, there was actually, there's actually very little evidence for human habitation on the Arabian Peninsula. The Arabian Gulf, I've heard it described uh, in prehistory terms as the elephant in the room. And uh, this is because there's been so little work done on it, about it. And it's very rarely mentioned when people are talking about the prehistory of, of the region, but I think it's actually key. It's really key and fundamental to our understanding of, um, of, of the prehistory here. It's, um, it's an area of 250,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's an area that w was once dry land. Um, if we take this out of the equation, we're missing a big chunk of the, of the, of the jigsaw of, of prehistory for here. So just a, a, a little brief background to submerged landscapes and why we have submerged landscapes and what submerged landscapes actually are. Uh, goes back to about 1913. Um, this is Clement Reed, who, was, uh, who joined the geological survey and was going around the coast of Britain and uh, realised that out at sea there were trees, uh, there were peat bogs and things like this. And he kind of started to understand that somehow sea levels had changed, but he wasn't quite sure how or, or what had actually happened. Moving on into the 1920s, we have uh, Milutin Milankovic, who um, looked at the, at the, well, basically how the, how the Earth revolves around the sun and realized that uh, the um, energy coming from the sun changed. Uh, oh, oh, well, the, the energy didn't change, but the way in which the Earth revolved around the sun changed. So the angle of tilt to the sun uh, changed over time. So this is the angle representation of the angle of the sun at the moment. So we can see we're about 23.4 degrees off, off, uh, off centre. Uh, the sun also wobbles slightly, uh, the earth wobbles slightly backwards and forwards as well. So about 13,000 years ago it would have been at, at a completely different angle. Which means that if the angle of the earth uh, the, the uh, northern hemisphere is further away from the sun at certain periods, certain times of the year, then, it, then there's more ice developing in the, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and this is, this is what actually one of the main reasons that causes the development of the ice ages, um, of which there's around about um, sort of eight, nine major ice age events. The other Part of it is eccentricity. So the actual rotation of the Earth changes slightly, so on its elliptical axis. So, it, so at times it goes slightly further away from the Sun as well. And this, this also changes the amount of ice that's in the Northern Hemisphere. The amount of ice in the Northern Hemisphere causes sea levels to drop and uh, exposes large areas of land. So moving on to about the 1930s, um, trawl, people who were trawling um, the seabeds, this is in, in the North Sea, started pu pulling up archaeological artefacts from the seabed. This is the Kalinda Harpoon, 
which is, which is a Mesolithic harpoon. So it's, it, this was actually pulled up in a big lump of peat. So they, people started to realise that some of these areas uh, were actually once dry land. So if we focus on the Gulf landscape and start actually thinking about what it, what it could have looked like. Now, this landscape is actually based on topography, so it's height data. Now, the, the uh, former landscape isn't necessarily the same as the topography because the Tigris and Euphrates rivers will be constantly depositing material. There'll be change, there'll be um, uh, sand being deposited, silts and so on in various areas on the, on the seabed. However, it does give us a, a snapshot, if you like, an idea of, of, um, of what's happening. In uh, 1996, Kurt Lambeck proposed in a paper where he, he examined the, the uh, depths of the sea in, in, in the Gulf in various areas, and he proposed that there were three main, formerly three main basins here. So these, these are um, exahaic basins, which means that they have a, 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 an inflow into them and an outflow. So formerly, we have the Tigris and Euphrates here, which is providing fresh water from the north, a river which would run through this, through this valley, uh, the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates, which is called the Urshat River Valley, into the, into the western basin, this one, which is at around about 70 metres below sea level, and then into the central basin, which is the deepest part here, uh, which is uh, the, the deepest part of the Gulf here is around about, um, about 100 metres deep. Uh, this basin would have, would have been um, around about, um, about 80 metres, at about 80 metres. So probably uh, could have formed a lake somewhere in the region of about 20 metres deep and around 220,000 square kilometres altogether. So that's, this, is, this is this main river valley uh, here. And then a third eastern basin, which is at a slightly lower point. So this, what this is, is a, a representation really of these three um, uh, river basins. And, th and so we've got the sea here. But actually, the sea at around at the peak of the last ice age would have been around about um, around about 120 metres below uh, existing levels today. So this is the the Bubian Shelf here, uh, and the sea would have been right right out here uh, off the coast of off the coast of Oman. <laughs> Some of these areas around here, you probably realise actually, these are very, very shallow areas. Uh, even you can go out 30, 40 kilometres here and it's only around about 20 metres deep, 20 to 30 metres deep, and then it suddenly shelves off in, down here, into, down to about 60 metres into, these, into the actual river valley here. The other thing that Kurt Lambeck noted was that these areas here were full of of um, basins as well. So basins that would fill up, basins that ha held water, possibly swamp areas, etc. Oops, sorry. So, yeah, so just really thinking about who was in this, in this landscape. So we have a, I mean, a, Sure, it's theoretical at the moment. We're thinking about what the landscape possibly was like there. Who was also inhabiting the landscape? Now, the closest idea that we have for that is, uh, are the Ubaid sites, which gen generally dating from about 5,800 um, BCE onwards. Now, they're called Ubaid sites because they have Ubaid pottery. Now, the, the Ubaid I think uh, you've probably heard Mark discuss this uh, before about this. We, we have a, a number of Ubaid sites within the Emirates down here. This is a vase that was found at Marawa, again, which would have come probably somewhere in southern Mesopotamia. 
uh, probably in this area, around Ur Eridu area here. So these, <coughs> excuse me, each of these red blobs here is a, is a major Ubaid site here. And, and actually notice, firstly, they're all coastal sites. This is, this is a point, they're, they're either on islands or they're nearly all coastal, very few inland along here. The second point is we've got nearly 500 kilometres here, from here to here. So why is there this contact between groups here in this area and, and, the, and the groups groups at the top there. What is the driving force behind this cultural exchange, uh, economic interaction that's going on between these two groups? So another aspect of this is also the hydrology of the, of the region. So this is the, the Damam, the extent of the Damam aquifer, which is broken up into two two parts, there's actually the upper Alat and the, the Kobar um, parts of this, of this aquifer. Now, the aquifer charges in this area around sort of northern Yemen, um, northern Salala region around here, and then the water's trapped under, uh, under non-porous rock within this area and comes out around the, around the Gulf area here. I mean, you probably aware of, of Bahrain, if you go back about 50, 60 years, there were, there were actually artesian springs in Bahrain, springs coming up out of the groundwater uh, in that region because the groundwater pressure was so high and that's groundwater pressure coming out of this aquifer. It takes thousands of years, maybe 20,000 years to get through this aquifer, but what it does mean is that this area has very high groundwater here. Again, possibly one of the reasons for the location of the Ubaid sites. I mean, certainly the, as, a co as coastal sites, they're able to exploit marine resources and they're able to exploit inland resources. So the next slide is, is actually a section, a schematic section from here, from A to B. Uh, just one other point to make as well. The reason that it flows in this direction is because the Arabian plate is subducting underneath the um, Eurasian plate, the Zag under, the, under the Zagros Mountains, basically. So the, the Arabian plate is tilting, with the higher area being in Yemen and around here, lower areas being towards the northern end of the, of the plate here. So when we look at the cross-section of that, what, what actually happens is rainfall here on the Arabian Shield permeates into the rock. Some of these rocks around here that are non-permeable, that, that one and, and these ones here, we end up with the rainfall permeating through over thousands of years. And the, and the piezomic pressure is dependent on the length of and, and depth of the aquifer here. And the same, same with this one. So we've got a lower aquifer, which probably was not accessible during the Neolithic, um, uh, Radherma aquifer, and the Damam aquifer over the top of it. So what this suggests is, and again, it's theoretical, what it suggests is that the river valley um, while it probably wasn't affected, and I'll, I'll just go back to this slide, pro probably wasn't affected by the greening of the, uh, of, of the desert. Uh, you might have come across this before, a change in the, in the climate here between about 10,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago caused the, uh, uh, the, the sorry, the, the um, summer monsoon to migrate northwards. So we currently have the extent of the, the southern monsoon here from about uh, 10,000 to about 6,000 years ago, it moved north, northwards, just about to the northern extent of the Emirates here. But it, uh, so far, there's very little suggestion that it traveled further into, into Saudi Arabia or into the Gulf area. but it may have benefited, that region may have benefited 
via the aquifers, via springs within, within, around, around the, the former river valley there. So we've not only got the Ubaid pottery, but another pottery type that's found in association with the Ubaid pottery is an Arabian courseware pottery. So that's generally found in this area. Now, again, the interesting thing about this is it's a local, it must be a locally made um, a pottery. It's not coming from southern Mesopotamia up here. It's found up here in Bahra 1 and in H3, but it's not coming from this region. So it's being made locally here, but we don't, there's never been any pottery sites of uh, Arabian coursewares that have been found so far. There are some, some arguments that it's made in very small industries, so you don't need a kiln, you just need a small fire, and you, you light, uh, you make, make a small fire perhaps with reeds and so on, and you put the, put the pot in and fire it, because they, it is a very, very low fired pottery, this. Um, but uh, again, we might have still expected some wasters coming from this, some pottery wasters. And, and, uh, and also to produce pottery, you need uh, uh, extensive amounts of fresh water, you need firewood, you need fuel, and you need good clay sources. And again, the, these clay sources, we don't find them associated with the Ubaid sites. So it starts to ask the question, where, where, where's this pottery coming from? So if we start to delve a little bit further and, and go further than just understanding the topography, and sure, we can understand a little bit about the, about the uh, river valley and the gulf and the, and the submerged landscape from the topo topographic data, but if we, if we genuinely want to then start mapping it and getting to grips with it, uh, the way forward with this is has to be through geophysics. I don't know, some of you might have actually dived in the Gulf, but most of the time when I've dived there, it's, it's very murky. Uh, the distance, the visibility is quite poor. It's very rarely more than about five or 10 meters. Um, certainly when we've been diving on anomalies, on geophysical anomalies, uh, we could be right by them within five or 10 meters of them. And we, sometimes we can't find them uh, simply because the visibility is so bad. So actually undertaking diver searches, looking for seabed anomalies in this, in this instance is certainly quite, quite difficult. Uh, this, is, um, this is 3D seismics data collection, which is done by, primarily by oil, oil companies. So what actually happens is there's a seismic source here. So in other words, a deep booming noise is given out from the back of the vessel, and then that signal bounces off each of the interfaces. So when it hits sand, it'll, it'll bounce back. When it hits the surface of the next layer down, maybe rock, it'll bounce back off that and so on and so on. And that way we're able to build up the sections. So each of these strings will produce a, sec a line section like this with the interfaces here. And then it's possible to put each of those sections together to create what's called a time slice. So this, is, this here is lots and lots of sections, lines here, that have then, then been put together and then cut through to produce this. And what, what we can then start to see is, is finer channels. So we're saying there's a river there, but, and we, we're pretty sure it's there because we're pretty sure that the Tigris and Euphrates River even 18,000 years ago was there. Sure, it was running through that landscape, so it was feeding that landscape. But actually, that's not enough. We need to know where is it, where is it running within that, within that landscape. And this provides the opportunity to do this. But what you actually find in this, in the geophysics, are lots of different channels, uh, rivers that overlap one another, wetland areas, and so on. So this can, be, this can be identified within this, but it's not actually clear which is the earliest, which is the latest. And what, we want, what we're then trying to do is to understand the chronology of that landscape. Uh, and that can be done 
within the time slices. So, uh, so attributing attributes, giving attributes to the pixels, building those up as uh, three, 3D, as a 3D image, vox, which is called voxel rendering. We can then render former, things like former channels, wetland areas, and see the relationship between each of those. This is, this is actually time slices that have, that have come from the North Sea here, this, these ones. This one is a, an interpretation. So we, um, uh, we analyzed 4,000 square kilometers of high resolution 3D seismic data right from the center part of the Gulf um, in this area. So an area between the Western Basin and the Central Basin that Lambeck talked about. We had just this area here. And actually what we can see in here Firstly, this is, this is um, fine sediments within in here. So this is sediments associated with lakes that, we can, that we've got here. And then we can see the river channel running down here. And then essentially what's the edge of the, of the, of the river valley here. So well, that's actually, this is kind of tilted round to the side. So you, you're looking at it then from the, from the south. So we've got the area of sediment here, river valley running through here, sorry, the uh, river channel running through here, river, then more towards the edge of the river valley where it drops down. So we're probably at about 25, 30 meters in, in, in these areas here, and then it's dropping down, in, down to about 60 meters in, this, in these areas. And then higher areas here. So these are, these would have been at one time former islands as the as the Gulf filled up slowly over time between about 18,000 and about seven and a half thousand years ago, these would have gradually become islands. Um, and we know, again, coastlines and islands are a focus for earlier activity. So, again, what, what, what more can we add into, into this? What, what does that actually tell us? What it, what it does is give us a focus for where we core, where we, where we can put some environmental cores in. Now, that provides context for, for, for coring, for environmental cores. We could put a, we could put a core in, you know, at, at random. We don't know what we're gonna get. We might say, oh, well, it's a, it's a channel or it's rock or something like that. But actually here, we can, we can target um, we can target a river valley, a river channel, we can target the lake basins precisely rather than, you know, targeting onto what might just be rock, for example. And what we did actually, we put a core in that was about, um, about 40 meters deep and we radio, well, OSL dated it back to about 380,000 years ago. And in that we can see the, the, the transgression and re the rise and fall of sea levels within the, um, within the core. Uh, we can see changes in the sea, sea surface temperature. And one of the things it tells us is that those lake basins that, um, that uh, Kurt, Kurt Langbeck um, suggested, we know that the lake basins were there because we can see them in the 3D seismic data, we can see them in the cores, but also the, the cores were not entirely fresh. They were, it was slightly saline water, not like seawater, but this is through analysis of diatoms within, within the core as well. Unfortunately, the top section of the core was missing about the top, um, about, about six to eight meters. So the, the earliest, the earliest, sorry, the very latest date that we got off the core was about 80,000 years ago. So the core, our core dates between about 80,000 and about 300 and 380,000 years ago. One of the other things that we tried with the core was to do sed 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 sedimentary DNA. So it's now possible to have thousands of, of, um, of DNA strings analyzed. So the DNA, strings that, that are within the sediments there uh, should, be, should be in good condition. What um, it suggests for the preservation of, of, of DNA is that it breaks down very quickly, but if it becomes 
uh, deposited in a, in a non-oxygen um, environment, it can become stable. So we were hoping that we'd be able to extract um, DNA from that, but we unfortunately weren't. So hopefully if we can eventually at some point get cores that are, um, that are less than 80,000 years, there's the opportunity to do that, that then starts telling us something more about the flora and the fauna within, within those areas. So again, starting to think about what, who, who was living there, what, um, what was the, the, the lifestyle like, what was, um, uh, you know, what were the houses like and so on. Uh, this is, this is a, actually a house from uh, southern, southern Iraq, from the Marsh Arabs. And I think this is a, a, probably a fair idea because um, probably quite a number, of that, a, a number of the houses, in fact, that we find from places like Dalma, Ain Asaya, from Dossaria, and a lot of the um, Ubaid sites that are, are along, along the Gulf, that they're actually similar to this. So, so these are, this is a, a site at Dalma that was, that's excavated by Dr. Mark Beach. Again, a circular, circular post hole house. So actually something like this, trying to find this in, in the marine en environment would be a bit like trying to find a needle in a haystack, really. Very, very difficult. The thing about the 3D seismic is it's very good at looking at landscapes, looking at large areas and large features, big features like river valleys, like rivers and lakes and so on. You can map those very well, but looking for archaeological sites then becomes much more difficult. However, there are other features from the period, and this is going back to Marawa again, where there's seven low mounds on the island of Marawa, which is a, lies about 130 kilometers to the west of, of Abu Dhabi. And here, there, these are stone-built buildings. This is the part of a tripartite, tripartite house that was excavated uh, at Marawa in, firstly in 2004 and then later in 2015. And the, uh, the walls from the tripartite house survived to about 70 to 75 centimetres high. Some of the mounds there are around about two, two and a half metres deep high as well. So. It's that there's certainly things that would show up on, um, on marine geophysics. Um, so there is the potential, certainly, to find this kind of thing. This is, uh, this is the second mound that was excavated at Marawa. Again, and you can see, actually, really very, very well built uh, buildings here. Um, dating. The earliest dates from Marawa are around about 7,800. So it actually predates um, sea level coming up to the levels that they're at today. And it's, I've found Marawa a little bit of a puzzle, really, because the dates are too early for it to really have been a, a coastal site. However, the uh, the the uh, assemblage the, the, fr from there, the fish assemblage, does suggest it's a coastal site, and there's certainly things like turtles, dugongs, etc., being found there. So it must be a coastal site. So there's a bit of a disparity between what we'd look at as as global framework for sea levels and the sea levels in Marawa, and I suspect that some of this has has to do with te tectonic change. So it's not actually just about uh, sea levels, it's about changes in the, in the Arabian plate, movements of the Arabian plate. Maybe, and, and e many of the islands along the southern Gulf, Gulf are partly salt di diapirs. So they're, they're actually being pushed up and, th and that is a not part of an ongoing process. So I, su I suspect that not only is it salt dye appears, but also the southern part of the Arabian plate is coming up slowly. And I, I think this is why it appears too high uh, in the topography um, to, to, to have been a marine site, while the archaeology is telling us that it certainly was. So 
This is uh, looking at the sea level change over, over the past 140,000 years. And we can see about 120,000 years ago, sea, sea level was around about the same as it is today, perhaps actually slightly higher, maybe about five to six meters higher than it is today. So probably where we are now would be, would be part of the sea during that period. And then, and then it, it rises and falls here, but still, even at 60 meters below sea level, the, the valley of the, the Urshat Valley in the Gulf would have been, would have been um, flooded fairly much, fairly well. Until we get to around about just after 30,000 years ago, and the, the period that Bretzker had, had mentioned, um, when sea levels drop right back and, that, and the, um, the Gulf Valley becomes, becomes an open landscape. So the actual repercussions around the, wo the, the world, um, there's, there's quite extensive areas of submerged landscape. Uh, there's an area here which is called Sunder, S Sunderland. There's Beringia, which is potentially to do with migrations into North America. Uh, this here is also the Wallace Line here, which divides the um, Australian fauna from the Southeast Asian fauna here. So we know that this area was never actually a, dry, a piece of dry land here. There wasn't a land bridge where, where they, uh, Australian fauna could have moved into Southeast Asia. So as the, the sea level, as the ice melted around about, from an from extent of around about 18,000 years ago, uh, from 127 meters, uh, slowly the, the area of the Gulf um, would have filled up and certainly the, the center, uh, the central lake would have, uh, which is around about 70 meters in depth uh, below sea level, prob probably uh, succumbed to marine transgression around about 12,000 years ago. This again, this is just from global sea level index points because we don't have uh, local index points at the, at the moment to, to, um, to check this against or reference it against. Uh, then around about 10,000 years ago, uh, the, the uh, the e sorry, the Western Basin would have um, would have succumbed to marine transgression, and uh, so note the Gulf didn't just fill up from the from sort of from the south here to the north. It actually filled up the the main part of the valley here first, leaving these areas north of um, north of Abu Dhabi around Bahrain here the uh, eastern side of Saudi Arabia. This is, this is all still open landscapes. And I'll go back to what I was saying about the hydrology. It's still got potential here to be providing springs in the lower lying areas around, around here. And another point really has to, has to do with the people that were living there. We, if we go back to the slide I showed you before where we have groups up here that are clearly connected to groups up here and down here. Um, there's been a number of theories as to why these people are trading over a thousand kilometers actually in some cases with one another. Why are these people, what culturally connects the people here and here, uh, obviously a gap here with the, with the people here. It's, uh, it's thought to be a maritime trade because that would have been the easiest way for these groups to connect with one another. But what was the impetus for them initially? What's the connection? And again, it's a theory, but potentially these are the people that are being pushed out of this area. They can't live here anymore. They're being pushed northwards. They're being pushed to the, to the west. They're being actually pushed southwards towards Abu Dhabi. So around about 8,000 years ago. So this is, this is actually Marawa here. And as I mentioned before, it's actually, if we, if we model sea levels at around about 8,000 years ago, it, it's, it's not a, 
It's not a coastal site. But you, uh, you can see again, large areas around Bahrain, large areas around the northern Emirates here are still open landscape. And if we look particularly at this area here at the bathymetry, is what I was mentioning about really at 8,000 8, about Marawa here. So we've got, we've probably got a small, I don't know, kind of uh, channel or, ch or creek or something coming in here. So it, it actually wouldn't take a great deal of uplift, a few metres really. So if, it, if this was a few metres lower, the models would put, would, would put this, the sea is coming literally round the southern side of Marawa into here. Again, if we look at, at Dalma, and we've got a, a large Ubaid site in Dalma. So presumably when Dalma uh, was originally star the, the origins of Dalma, this area here was almost uh, probably fairly newly flooded or maybe areas of, of swampland, marshland and, and so on. And then of course in the, in the northern gulf, uh, sea levels continued, continued to rise beyond current day level, probably up to around about two or three metres um, beyond sea levels uh, today. Okay, so it's just a, 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 it's quite nice a little animation to show the sort of filling, infilling of the gulf. So again, looking at ways that we can actually investigate uh, this landscape. So I mentioned about the uh, 3D seismics that we can use. There's also side scan sonar. So side, side scan sonar gives a signal out each side which is reflected off the seabed. So it, it literally sees what's on the seabed. But the beauty of this is we can have a swath width of up to about 150, 200 meters and we can survey very, very large areas very quickly. It also means that things like, if there are mounds, like the mound, uh, mounds that we've got at Marawa, if there's burial mounds and so on, and we know from radiocarbon dates that many of the burial mounds um, in uh, sort of eastern Saudi and around the, the uh, coastal areas go back uh, sort of six and a half to seven thousand years um, for sure. So there's no, no reason why there, 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 there aren't similar features uh, within the Gulf. So this is, um, we actually tow this behind the vessel and then literally drive the vessel up and down in lines like this and then stitch the lines together here like this. This gives us a very nice image of the, of the seabed. It's very good for finding uh, wrecks, modern wrecks. Um, older wrecks, a little bit more difficult because um, the wooden wrecks don't survive very well uh, on the seabed here. It's too shallow and it's too warm for them uh, to survive. They tend to rot very quickly. So what, you, what you're likely to find is that there'll be a mound with, uh, associated with ballast and so on. And the problem, problem with that is trying to determine what is a natural mound and what is a, a mound associated with either a wreck or a, or a former or, or something like Marawa uh, structure and, or, or so on. And actually just going back to Marawa, I think one very interesting thing about the Ubaid period is that people start building houses you know, we, t we take it for granted, uh, a house. It's a concept that we, we've never even probably th ever thought about that somebody has to think, think about that as a, as a concept, living in, living in a house. And certainly periods after, um, after the Ubaid period, when, when we come into the Bronze Age, people are uh, moving around a lot more. They're, lot, they're a lot less sedentary, they're, mo they're more mobile and people are more difficult to, uh, archaeological sites tend to be more ephemeral and difficult to locate. But what actually makes people start building houses at that point? Where does this come from? Because they appear around the Gulf Coast all at the same time. 
and I would tentatively suggest this is an idea that's coming further out from within the Gulf. This is ideas that people are bringing with them from deeper parts, deeper parts of the Gulf. So we can also, we can use this for monitoring change. We can use it for mapping the seabed. We can use the side scan sonar. These scars along here are actually scars from a trawler. Um, trawling is no longer allowed, fortunately, in, in um, Abu Dhabi. It's been banned since the 19, 1970s uh, because it does so much damage to the seabed. And similarly, it does damage, obviously, to archaeological deposits, not just environmental damage. So we can, we can use this to build up uh, maps of damaged areas where we're most likely to find archaeological deposits, we can, we start putting lots of different types of data together, 3D seismic with sub-bottom profile, with, together with, um, with a side scan sonar data, and then, and, and also the bathymetric topographic data, the higher the resolution, the better, that then really starts to narrow down areas for, for further research. Uh, this is, um, I just mentioned about the side scan sonar picks up wrecks. This is a wreck that we, that we picked up. Very, now um, actually very nice because you can see all of the ribs even inside the, inside the wreck. And I'll, I'll actually show you some photographs of this right, right at the end as well. And uh, this, is, this is a very bizarre, uh, very bizarre um, anomaly. It's around about 150 metres from, it's on the seabed in about seven metres of water. It's about 150 metres long, it's 27 metres uh, wide, and it's, um, it looks almost to be form a triangle at the top here with two lines coming down either side, lots of lumps and bumps kind of either side of it. So again, I, d I don't know what to make of it, and I've not had the opportunity to go back and and dive it again and or to even work out what it is but it's definitely there it was in a it was in a data set that we looked at uh, um, f from 2008 that were taken by a, a infrastructure company uh, we went back and surveyed it and we found it again uh, this was in 2000 about 2014 we, we got a chance to dive it very briefly. We took some photographs, and the people who dived it said, the guys said, they couldn't really see anything there. And, and I mean, I, I do understand that to some extent because it, it goes back to what I was saying before, that often the visibility there isn't very good. It's quite, it's quite poor, and unless we actually uh, start um, digging this, start, start ex some form of excavation, on it, and it might not be anything, I, I accept that. Uh, but unless you actually get down below the seabed, there's, there's not much chance of actually understanding it because this is, we've got seagrass around it and what appears to be a basin here. And it's only, it's only about 40 centimetres deep. So when, you, when you're diving in those conditions, really it, it doesn't look like there's, a, like there's anything there. And this is, uh, this is putting together, again, uh, side scan sonar data and what what we can I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow as well um, what, what we're able to do with this is look at the reflectance coming back off the side scan sonar so we can tell what's on the bottom is it seagrass is it is it rock uh, is it areas of silt and it also gives some in indication of the grain size on the, on the seabed and start putting that together as as polygons here all of this is helping us to build up and to map that area, to map, you know, uh, areas that otherwise would be really quite impossible to understand. And, uh, and we, we can also use this um, to start thinking about where are areas where, for example, wrecks might survive, where, where are areas where potentially archaeological deposits might survive. So that's really just covering um, the submerged landscapes uh, part of, um, of this. Uh, I'll just talk very briefly about, about other, other aspects, which are uh, the pearling side of, 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 of um, the Gulf. Obviously, 
This is a very, very extensive pearling. We know goes back even to the Neolithic period. There's been pearls found on a number of, uh, of Ubaid sites. Uh, and it, so it's a tradition that, go, that, that, that continued right, right the way up until the last century, start of the last century. It's quite interesting. We geo-referenced a number of pearl maps and found that they actually didn't, they didn't kind of correlate with one, with one another here. But um, again, it's interesting whether, whether these pearl beds still survive or not. Um, we, we don't, we don't, we, we can't really tell at the moment. I, I mentioned about, uh, about shipwrecks. This is, this is actually a photograph when we, before anything was built on Sadiat. So this is Sadiat Island here, looking over towards uh, Abu Dhabi. And before the bridge was built, we did a, we did a survey of, um, uh, of Sadiat Island. Um, and I, I just took the photographs of these, of these old dows here. The issue is if these, if these sink um, in, um, in the Gulf, the, the chances of them surviving is very small. I mean, we, we've, done, we've done a lot of side scan sonar survey, a lot, and we've never found a dow. We've found modern, modern shipwrecks. Uh, we've found pottery on the seabed. We've found modern steel hauled vessels like, like this one. Um, they're fairly easy to pick up on the side scan. When you, when you go over one, you see it absolutely clear as day. Uh, but the, we, haven't, we never found any, any uh, wooden wrecks. So the possibility of finding a sort of complete wreck is, is, is small. Um, but certainly if it's, if it's covered in sediment, if it's maybe ballast, the, the, the base of the wreck has the potential to survive. But again, it goes back to trying to find it. You know how it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack a little bit. Uh, this, is a, this is a wreck called the Pericles, which is a super tanker that's upside down in the center of the Gulf. Um, it turned over in, in, in about 1983. Uh, it's just the pro propeller, the back propeller off it. Um, also, it's very useful, uh, archaeologists working to get together with environmentalists, because very often um, environmental, the EAD, they, they have boats, they know, they know the area very, very well, uh, but they're also interested in in mapping, when knowing where seagrass is, in, in, in mapping the Gulf. So that geophysics work has a, has a dual value, really. It's valuable to archeologists, but it's also val valuable, provides valuable maps on, on the seabed um, for the environmentalists. So, and we've worked together very, very successfully with environmental departments to gather data. They've provided the boats, we've provided the geophysics teams, and then we've shared the data at, at the end of it. So, and wrecks also are, are important because these are microcosms. There's the uh, seabed generally there, it's, it's very flat. It's, it's a bit like the terrestrial um, desert here. Uh, and the fish will normally uh, congregate around a reef or seek, seek out a reef so the, uh, the, the, when the wreck sinks it starts to form an artificial reef which becomes a focus then for sea life and consequence of interest to the environment departments. So this is just a little bit, this is the last, last couple of images really showing how we've been, record we've been recording wrecks previously. This is some work actually that I was doing previously when I worked together with the University of Birmingham. Uh, and this is the wreck that I showed you on the side scan sonar previously. Uh, so this is the one with the, ri with the ribs in here. And actually, um, we, couldn't, we couldn't see this. You can't, this is not a photograph that you could actually take because the water's so, the visibility in the water's so bad. So what we actually did was went swim up and down it in transects uh, like this, taking overhead pho photographs of it and then photographs around the side. And then we used 
program called Agisoft to stitch it together. This is just really to show you the resolution of this. So you can zoom right in and actually traditional methods of recording this would be quite difficult. You, if, if it's difficult to measure and record something on land, it becomes 10 times more difficult in the water. And then these can, this can all be stitched together um, to provide a 3D model of, of, of the shipwreck. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.